It is my great joy and delight, hello friends, to be with you and to be with Adrienne Marie Brown and to bring her tremendous heart and intelligence to our Walking Together series. Let me tell you a little bit about Adrienne Marie Brown, social justice facilitator who's focused on Black liberation, a pleasure activist, a doula and healer, and the author of several books, including Emergent Strategy, Holding Space, and the New York Times bestseller, Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good. Here's how Adrienne describes herself in her book, Emergent Strategy. I'm an auntie, sister, daughter, W-O-E, which stands for Working on Excellence, Writer, Facilitator, Coach, Mentor, Mediator, Pleasure Activist. I'm going to keep swaying here as I do this. Sci-fi scholar, doula, healer, tarot reader, witch, cheerleader, singer, philosopher, queer, black, multiracial, lover of life living in Detroit. There's a lot to talk about here, obviously, and as I said, a great joy and delight. Adrienne Marie Brown, welcome. Thank you, Tammy. It's nice to meet you and be here with you. I've been immersed in your writing for the past couple of days, and there are many things that really struck me that I'm excited to talk with you about. Mm -hmm. And the first is this notion that's a term I'd never heard before called fractal responsibility mm -hmm. and how what's in the most minute is happening in the whole. And I wanted to start off by talking with you about that is because often I think people think about this notion of taking personal responsibility. And there's this idea, well, yeah, but that's not good enough. That's not good enough. That's never going to change the structures in our society if we're all just focused on our personal responsibility, mm -hmm. inner growth work, how we are as a fractal. So I wanted to hear your, your view on that as a way to begin. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's so interesting to me because I have always pushed, you know, I'm like, it's not enough to just do your own thing. It's not enough to just recycle your own stuff. And simultaneously also true, it's not enough to not do that. Like you need to do all those things. And I think so often, especially for people who are trying to change the world, we get very, very focused on what everyone else is doing and pointing our finger at everyone else's bad behavior, racism, capitalism, greed, um, we don't keep the lens on our own behaviors and on how these large systems of oppression manifest in each one of us. And I feel like there's the both and. And I learned about fractals um, as I was learning about emergence and complexity sciences and chaos theory and all these other things, um, in part by reading Margaret Wheatley's leadership in the new sciences. And I started to have my eyes open to that this reality that I was like, oh, there's these patterns that repeat themselves from the smallest scale that we can document or measure up to the largest scale. And so some of the fractals that people might be familiar with is like ferns or broccoli, where when you look at it at a small scale, it's the shape of the whole. If you look at the Delta, you know, right now the, the entire Gulf region is all flooded. It's all the Delta river banks that are all flooded and overflowing. That's the same thing that happens in our bodies, right? We have these deltas of river veins, basically arteries moving through us. I love that idea of pattern, that patterns on the small scale echo up to the largest scale. Fractal responsibility is saying, how do I operate in a way that is responsible to my vision in a way that can echo out to the largest scale? that it's not just pointing fingers and asking other people to change, but recognizing that the kind of change I can make in the world is directly related to the change I'm willing to make within myself. And again, both and, right? So as I change, it requires new relationships. So literally the fractal universe around me shifts as well. Um, and then as my community changes, where we live has to change. As we change, we can change the world in that way. So, so to summarize, you would say it's a it's a both and approach that you embrace. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it, it's it's about recognizing that everything is connected, and if you're not willing to play your part, if you're only willing to point fingers, nothing will actually change. 
Now, you, you mentioned uh, Margaret Wheatley, and mm -hmm. uh, she's someone whose work I also deeply respect, and you mm -hmm. quote her in Emergent Strategy, talking about how what we need right now is not so much gathering a critical mass, but engaging in critical relationships. What, right. what makes a relationship critical, and what do you mean by engaging in critical relationships? Yeah, I feel like I'm learning this one all the time, and I think that the shared experience of COVID-19 has actually been a great teacher for what a critical relationship is. Um, so the way I think of it is a relationship that can stay connected and authentic and where both people can really be present under the pressures of change and under the pressures of crisis, um, under the pressures of love, right? So when I think of it in a political sense, uh, for a long time, I was, I was socialized uh, as an organizer that I was trying to build as large of a mass of people moving in a direction as possible. And critical mass was that point at which the number that we grew was large enough to actually impact the thing we were trying to change. So critical relationship, critical connection, right, is where the connection we have is deep enough to actually allow our transformation to happen. And I'm in several critical relationships now. Um, but I think of it also, you know, it's the question between a petition, you know, signing a petition and actually sitting down and engaging in a conversation until your worldview shifts in some fundamental way. Um, I think too often right now, we have people who are willing to sign a petition, but not actually willing to engage in a hard conversation or intervene on an instance of racism or um, step up and take accountability for harm that they've done. I think critical connections allow for those kind of acts Mm -hmm. And if you were to say these are the guidelines personally that you use yeah. to cultivate critical mm -hmm. relationships, what, what are those? <sighs> hmm. I like that question, Tammy. You know, I feel like there's a piece of it for me that is there's something organic in my system that says yes to the connection. So I learned that in pleasure activism, that there's something in me that's like, there's something I'm drawn to or something I wanna be a part of here. And I'm compelled. I'm not here for obligation. Um, I'm not here to represent anything. I'm actually here because I wanna be here. I'm just gonna say and yes right now. Yes. 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 Okay. Right? yes, right here. And then there's a big part of it also for me that is about honesty. If I find that my instinct is to contort and to lie, to hide, to protect someone, if I feel like I can't tell the truth, um, then I'm like, we can't really be in a critical connection. And sometimes you can try, you know, like I've definitely been in situations where I'm like, is that what you really feel right now? Is that what you really want to say? Is that what you really need? You know, um, I'm really blessed right now. I'm in partnership with someone who regularly asks me like to tell the truth, who really wants to hear the truth from me. And it has astounded me to recognize how much of my life has been being asked to um, tell the lies of kindness, you know, uh, the lies of politeness and the lies that keep me from being able to actually take accountability for my own life and my choices and my responsibilities. So I would say that yes, and that a thousand percent honesty, like I go out of my way to make sure I'm telling the truth. And then accountability in the, in the sense of like one of my very closest friends will make a joke to each other. We'll be talking, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the other person is, don't punch me, but I need to say whatever it is, right? And a lot of times it's those moments of intervention of like, I hear you telling a story, an old story, a story that's out of alignment with your values, a story that's not aligned with your highest purpose. And don't punch me, but I got to tell you that, right? It's related to the honesty, but it's also a, a willingness to hold up the mirror to people and just be like, this isn't it. This isn't what you say you believe or wanna be doing. Um, and then we go from there. So. I just wanna underscore that what I think you're saying here, especially about this thousand percent or gajillion percent, whatever yes. we wanna say. Yes, total honesty. honesty. <laughs> it's really tough. It's, it's really so tough. Hard. And you know, here I started a company called Sounds True. Yes. Uh, focus on the truth. 
yeah. know, 36 years ago. And yet I still find, whether it's in my 20 year marriage now yeah. or in relationships with my closest friends, that I have to dig deep. Oh, I have yes. to dig deep to, to be as honest as I feel inside and find the skillful ways to do that and oh, not, yeah. not bury things. Like it's tough. How do that. you do it? Uh, I thought I was asking the questions. Um, <laughs> well, I'll answer how do I do you it? Do. No, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I, what, in the areas where I'm not, it, mm. it, um, it bothers me. Yeah. I can feel it. I feel disturbed. Yes. And when I feel disturbed, I toss and I turn and I wrestle. Yeah. And I find that I have to come forward in order to be in integrity with myself. Yeah. But I'm just saying it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. It's really hard. I, I have had to, you know, I, I've got a perfectionist organizer shape. Um, and so when I first was like, I'm going to practice honesty, uh, honesty all the time. And I was so serious and so rigid and it was painful. And I, I kept really coming down harshly on myself for the moments where I was like, you know, that you thought this and you didn't say it or whatever. Um, I had to really get softer with myself and I had to get a lot more curious with myself. So now when I notice that I'm out of alignment, like if I notice like, you know, someone hurt my feelings. And a lot of times, you know, it'll show on my face. So someone will hurt my feelings and then it shows. And it's like, well, are you okay? Or like, what's going on? I'm like, I'm fine. Right. Just that little moment, catching that and just being like, what is that? Right. It, it, why would I say I'm fine when actually my feelings are hurt? And this person I think can handle that truth. The vulnerability of it is so hard for me. And I love therapy for this. I love working with healers for this to kind of get up under like, why wouldn't I be honest in that moment? You know, what am I attending to or protecting or taking care of? And are there other ways to take care of it that don't require me to contort myself away from the truth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanna, I wanna talk more about emergent strategy and towards the beginning of the book, you share the principles of emergent strategy. And there are a couple of them, especially that I really wanted to ask you about that. I was like, I need to yeah. understand this more. Uh, you know, the first one, small is good, small is all. Yeah. And even though we began our conversation by talking about fractal responsibility, yes. I wanna hear more about this because I think a lot of times people don't feel small is all. They feel yeah. small makes me a runt who's not yeah. really contributing during this critical time. And they feel yeah. like people feel bad about themselves because they're just doing something small. Yeah, I mean, you know, I love this one. For me, it helps my shoulders relax a little bit. And, and what I learn inside of it is, it's not that things won't become large. It's not that they're not massive things happening, but they're all made up of small parts. And, that's true also of our species, that we have this massive species, which, you know, for instance, right now is having this horrific impact on the planet that we live on, that is our source of all life. We have a species that is somehow working against that and trying to dominate and pretend we're the only one here. But that species is made up of a lot of small parts. And I can't change what happens for the entire species, but I can absolutely change what I do as a small component of that species. And I can start to be in different relationships with the other small components of that species. Anything large we wanna do is only gonna be possible because of authentic shifts that happen in those small components and small relationships. And this really became clear to me um, as an electoral organizer back in the uh, early 2000s, I was doing electoral organizing, trying to get Bush out of office and stop the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I was like, we have to stop the federal government from doing this. And it was so humbling for me to acknowledge that I, as an individual person, I, as an organizer, wasn't able to have that scale of impact. I had to really sit with what scale can I have? And what I learned, and I started traveling around the country and asking people this, was I wasn't practicing democracy. Like I wasn't uh, actually in my life practicing democracy. And I started asking other people this, do you practice democracy in your household? Do you have a democratic process around your budget for your block or for your community? And everywhere I went, the answer, you know, some people might say like, yeah, our household is some democratic process. Usually if I probed a little bit, it was like actually one person is tyrannically making most of the decisions in the household. But 
when I kept asking the question, what I discovered was at a small scale, at the local scale, at the intimate scale, most of us aren't practicing democracy, but we're astounded by the fact that our democracy keeps failing at the largest scale. It keeps not actually serving the majority of the people. It keeps leading to horrific decisions like the, you know, as we sit here having this conversation right now, we're in this precarious place where um, Texas is overturning Roe v. Wade, basically. And it's like, oh, how could that happen when over half the nation <laughs> needs to be in a position to be able to make this choice for themselves? It's because we don't actually practice democracy until we're in a crisis and it needs to happen at a large scale. So that's some of what I mean by it, sure. right? It's but, like, but how let, me do we start you, to... let me ask you a question about mm -hmm. that to make that real, because I'm yeah. trying to reflect in my life Good. where I could practice democracy. And yeah. clearly in my, uh, in my intimate relationship, that's a yeah. place for yeah. a true kind of relationship of equality and our yeah. votes matter the same amount. Uh, at yeah. work, most of us uh, aren't in a democratic workplace and sounds true is right. not a democratic workplace. There's a lot of room for input, but it's, yeah. it's, not, a, it's not a democracy. So yeah. most of us don't have workplaces that function that that's way. Right. Um, and not all of us are involved in uh, a community. Like we don't know what that means, really. What does that even That's mean right. to be part of the Democrat? So how would I make this real in my life? Is what I'm That's curious great. about. So you know, it can look a lot of different ways. One of the first things is just exactly what you did to look around you and say, like, am I in community and in spaces where we all get to actually weigh in on what's happening and we get to be honest about the resources, the capacity, what we're bringing to the table. We get to determine what are the priorities of what happens here. And that doesn't necessarily mean no hierarchy ever happens, right? Democracy isn't a collectivist process necessarily, right? It means that everyone actually gets to play a part, be a part of the process. And I've started to practice this, you know, and this is, I mean, it's so fun as an organizer to realize you're doing the exact opposite <laughs> from what you wanted to do. But, you know, I definitely have come into spaces and been like, oh, this relationship only works because I'm totally in charge of everything or this, this, you know, aspect of my family life only works because I am trying to control everyone or it works for me because I control everyone. And the thing that's happening is we're trained to do hierarchy. We're trained to do dominance. We're trained to compete with each other, but we're not trained to do governance, to share this sense of decision-making and to think about the relationships we have that lead to resourcing everything that we have. So, a, one of the first places to practice that is finding out what we could we do in our workplace to make this a place where, you know, the majority of us spend the majority of our lives working, right? How could we make the places where we work more democratic? What would that look like? And it doesn't have to be a top down thing. In fact, it shouldn't yeah. be, right? It's really yeah. asking everyone, what would, what would it look like for you to have more responsibility over the direction of this yeah. place, right? What would that look like? And and then the governance piece of it is also crucial, right? Is we're not learning to govern. We have politicians who are also not really learning to govern. They're performative. They're learning to get our votes. They're learning to campaign, but we see the mess that happens when most of them actually get into office. So there's just all these places where we can start to be like, what would it look like to take responsibilities for that small D democracy? And you might have also read in the books, I consider myself a post-nationalist. Part of that is because I think that the structure of the nation state is actually at odds with how humans need to be in relationship with each other. This idea of outsourcing governance, handing it over to the electoral college or to some representative body, instead of saying, we live here, the resources are here. We have to figure out how to move forward. How do we do that in relationship with each other? I think eventually we'll get back to that much more tribal organization of humans. Um, I think for the long, long haul, that's actually more functional than what we have now. I like that idea. And we're gonna talk about this future visioning uh, okay. that you're so deeply engaged with. I wanna briefly just return to the principles of emergent strategy. Yes, please. And that the, was just the, one of them. So I know, and, and, there's, and there's, <laughs> there's a couple here that I really, I wanna to get to the one that's most important to me. So the second okay. one you write about change is constant, be like water. Okay, mm -hmm. we're gonna let that flow by here and go to number three, cause this is the one that I got stuck on. Good. There is always enough time for the right work. Yeah. I thought to myself, I don't know if I believe that. I really don't know if I believe that. I've got yeah. to ask Adrian about that. 
You got to ask me. I mean, you know, this book, I was writing this book really for facilitators and organizers, right? And I was thinking, I've been facilitating for over two decades now. And one of the, um, the pieces of feedback that I often get is like, wow, we ended early. We got everything done that needed to happen. We, we addressed the most important stuff. And I learned this one, um, you know, in that process of working, of facilitating was just like, oh, a lot of times it feels like we don't have enough time because we're really focused on the wrong things. We're really distracted by either things that are beyond our capacity to work on or by things that have happened in the past and we can no longer do anything about. Um, or we're trying to uh, cover everything at once. And one of the things that I love to do is help people figure out the right work. And by right work, I often mean, what is the most elegant next step, which is a, a question I learned from my friend Gibran Rivera. What is the piece we can actually attend to here and now? I often think of it as like, you know, when you've set up dominoes in a, in a space, it's like if you hit that first domino, it's actually going to knock everything else over. I will ask groups that, right? What is the domino? What is the thing that we need to start on that will actually open the way for some of these other issues? So an example of this, a lot of times groups will come in and they'll be like, we need a five-year plan and, and a compelling vision, a clear message, a clear communications plan. We need a budget. We need all this stuff. The domino is you need a good decision-making process, right? If you have a really solid, functional, proposal-based decision-making process, I lean towards consensus. If you have a good decision-making process, then the rest of those things can happen because you have a really good way that you all have agreed to of doing that work. But the amount of times I show up and a group has no real decision-making process and they're surprised that they can't move the rest of their work, it really shocks me, right? So the right work is what can we actually attend to in this moment that the right people are in the room for? That's another big piece of it is we waste a lot of time trying to make decisions that we can't make because we're not the right people to make those decisions um, or we don't have enough information. So the right work might be, we need to do more research. We need to slow this down. We need to clarify the process. Um, but I find that when you're doing the right work, often you end like five minutes early. All right, so I, I guess I have to ask this and I'm sure you've heard this from a lot of people when they hear the word consensus, they break out in hives and think it's- Oh, absolutely. Take eons not Absolutely. enough time to get the work done uh, not <laughs> not in not in five minutes early so how do you put those two together well i'm blessed because my sister autumn is a consensus teacher and she really blew my mind around consensus because i had that same i was like mm, no and this one actually ties into another aspect of emergent strategy which is around trust and that when you're building trust with people, it's very slow. But once you have trust with people, things can move a lot faster. Consensus works that way, where when you're first starting to practice consensus with people, first getting to know each other, um, consensus can be very slow because people don't necessarily trust the process. They don't trust that they can um, articulate their concerns or ask the question that might slow the process down a little bit. Um, one of the main reasons consensus is slow is because people don't speak up in the right time and then are like, I want to block this, <laughs> you know, at the last minute when it's time to move. So part of it is that trust building work. The more trust you have, the smoother consensus is um, and the quicker it can move um, because you start to recognize, oh, we shouldn't have a decision making conversation until there's a proposal on the table. The proposal shouldn't just come out of thin air. We should have a conversation about what we want in this proposal so that by the time you're having a decision conversation, it's like, oh, we talked about this. We said what we wanted. We developed a proposal for how that could happen. We're discussing this proposal. We want to do it. And I've been a part of groups where consensus was a two-minute process, right? Mm -hmm. I've been a part of groups where consensus was a three-day process. Both were right for what they needed to be. Yeah. Well, I, I want to ask you a question about mm -hmm. trust, because it's clear to me that being able to develop trust with other people and the groups we work with is, you know, supremely important. Yeah. And you've already talked about this thousand percent honesty and holding people yeah. accountable. But what else uh, do you think 
uh, in working with groups. I know you have a, a, a new book, Holding Space. Yeah. Uh, what helps us create uh, groups of people who actually trust each other? Well, I you know one thing is trust is not a static thing, right? So it's not like you're just like, well, I trust you. And that's how it is forever. You know, I think of it more like, um, I think Murahayu Shiba, the founder of Aikido talked about, you know, mastery this way. That's like, it's not that you never fall down, but it's that you recover quicker and quicker each time. I think of trust that way. It's not, it's not like you're never untrustworthy or out of integrity, but you're able to come back quicker and quicker to a place where you're like, oh, um, I was out of integrity. And I think integrity and trust go together. They're like two pieces of the puzzle. So when I say integrity, it's that what you say and what you do, what you say and what you believe are as closely aligned as possible, if not one thing. And for me, trust starts to shake and break when there's a, a gap of integrity, when people are saying something, but not doing that thing. Um, and especially if they repeatedly do it, or they're doing something and they're not actually saying and acknowledging that they're doing it, that gap of integrity opens. And when you recognize there's a trust breakdown, you have to figure out, are we committed to coming back to each other? Can we knit ourselves back into relationship again? And there's two pieces of it. There's the extension of trust and then there's being trustworthy. And there's this beautiful quote from Lao Tzu, which I also included in Emergent Strategy, which it, it's in the Tao Te Ching. The original quote is, if you don't trust the people, they become untrustworthy. And I flipped it to say, if you trust the people, they become trustworthy, which is what I have found happened in most organizations. Um, the addendum that I've added over the years has been, or the boundaries become clear. And that's because sometimes, you know, I think that anyone given enough time and attention and extension of trust can become trustworthy. I do believe that, but we don't always have all the time. <laughs> we don't always have forever to give to people. In our organization, sometimes we're working on a quick timeline. And if someone's untrustworthy, we have to set a boundary so that we can continue to move the work and hope that they can keep on their journey. So that's some of the stuff around trust that feels important mm -hmm. to share. Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, the fourth principle of emergent strategy, there is a conversation in the room that only these people at this moment can have, find it. And yeah. what I wanted to understand is as a facilitator for so many years, yeah. What is it that you're doing? How? What's your mm -hmm. posture? Your the, yes. the glasses you're wearing, or whatever that you're yeah. to hear the conversation that needs to be had in the room. What are you doing? Well, you know, so this is part of the reason I wrote the book Holding Change was because I was like, I need people to understand the um, the specifics of what happens here. So for me, um, I tend to listen before, during, and after, right? Like I'm, I'm in a deep listening process all the time and I'm feeling the room and I'm really attending to what I'm both feeling and what I'm hearing because that's where I start to feel like, is there an alignment? Are these people actually saying what needs to be said or is there that tension? And I think we all know that tension when we feel it. We don't always know how to put our finger on it, but where there's some conversation, energetic conversation or tension that's the unspoken, the elephants in the room. And I always think that the elephants, like they feel like energetic elephants. Like I'm like, there's something in this room that's massive and pushing up against all of us and it's not being spoken. And sometimes you can find that out with pre-surveys, right? It's just asking people beforehand, like, what do we need to talk about? What are the top priorities? What's not getting addressed in this organization? What could this organization do to actually grow, right? You ask these questions beforehand. Sometimes that needs to be anonymous because what's happening is so tense that people are scared to say the truth, or maybe there's a pattern of firing people who say the truth and other things like that. I have a good friend and comrade, Makani Themba, who actually wrote an essay in Holding Change. And one of the practices she does when we've co-facilitated together is she'll actually have everyone anonymously write on a post-it note, like what's not being said right now? and just write it there, put it in a bowl, take a break. And then we sit as facilitators and get to actually look at that and process it a bit and just, you know, learn a little bit more about the group. One of the things that is important to me is you cannot hold what you don't know about. You cannot have a conversation that people won't speak 
right? Like as a facilitator, I cannot force people to do anything that they're not ready to do or willing to do. And that's why that conversation is like the right people in the right time. Um, sometimes I'm sitting in a room, you know, full of white people who want to talk about diversity and why it's not happening in their space. And I'm like, y'all could talk about it, but you're not the right people to necessarily talk about it because it's too homogenous and you don't actually know the answer to this. You know, you might have ideas, but the conversation you want to have would require inviting people who for some reason are not interested in this space to come and give you feedback on why, you know? Um, so sometimes that right conversation is like, who else do we need to invite here, right? Sometimes the right conversation is, what are we scared to speak out loud? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, one thing I noticed, Adrian, is when I referred to your new book, I think I called it Holding Space, and then you uh, oh, kindly yeah. slipped in that it's actually <laughs> called Holding Change. It's called and, Holding uh, Change. <laughs> and yet well, there's because... probably a connection. Uh, and there is. I, I say I it in the book. I yeah. that way because of my own yes. sort of space. Well, and also holding nature. space is the way we talk about, you know, it's the way like those of us who facilitate often say we're holding space. And I, I mentioned in the book, that I call it holding change for uh, many reasons. One is um, that there's my sister and a friend of hers, Marie's, have done this powerful set of workshops called Holding Space. And I'm hoping they write a book <laughs> called Holding Space at some point. Um, but also the work that I've done is really how are we changing the world in ourselves? And so it's not just holding space where anything can happen. I really want to hold spaces where transformation is possible. No. Okay, the fifth principle here, never a failure, always a lesson. Yeah. So how do we have that attitude in our own life about so many things, especially things where yeah. we sit down with ourselves and we go, you know, actually, I think that was a failure. How do we Yeah, how do we I mean, <laughs> you know, one of the things that it's so funny because people are like, but sometimes I do fail. And I'm like, no, we, we are failing all the time. But the framework that we have on it determines whether it is a waste of our lives or a component that helps us to learn. And I like, uh, you know, in my own life, I'll have a moment where I lose my temper or I knock something over or, you know, the things that can feel like minor failures in, in life. And even at that small scale, I have been teaching myself to slow down in that moment and be like, what's the, what am I learning right now? Like, what is the lesson of this for me? When I knock something over, it's because I was moving too fast and I wasn't being attentive generally, right? And then I ask myself, why is that? Why am I moving urgently? Um, usually because I'm trying to avoid an emotion, you know, for me, right? everyone's different. Um, or I lost my temper. What can I learn from this? I've been repressing the truth. I've been repressing something I needed to say and I repressed it long enough for it to build up into a problem. And now it's coming out of this way. Um, or I am full of grief and rage about something that's happening in the world. And I haven't given my time, myself time to feel that, to sit with my altar to process that. So it's jumping out at the pe male person, <laughs> you know? Um, so to me that there's that process of slowing down and being what, what is the lesson? And I think in group process, this becomes the difference between groups that feel like they are succeeding and actually can make a change and groups that constantly feel like they're failing regardless of what they're actually doing in the world. I see a lot of social justice groups that constantly feel like they're failing or behind the curve. And it's like, we're actually up against insurmountable odds. We have to pull off miracles if we're gonna save human life on this planet at this point. So we could feel like failures all the time, but that's not gonna save our lives. We have to be learning from everything that we're doing, how to keep improving and how to keep growing. I'm curious if there's something in your own life where you would say this was a really big thing that felt like a failure to me oh, and I was yeah. and I was able to re <laughs> and I was able to reframe it in time yeah. and how you reframed it oh that's a good question um you know most recently I, there's so many <laughs> you know as a human being I'm, I'm stacked full of things that felt like failures in the moment but most recently when it was time uh when they started announcing like okay, people who are vaccinated can go outside with no mask and spend time with other vaccinated people and all this. Um, my partner was like, I'm ready to go outside and hang out with people. And I freaked out and 
totally was like having meltdowns and just like, I don't understand why you need friends. <laughs> like it's not safe. And I didn't go up. I wasn't going about it in a good way. I wasn't going about it in a mindful way. I was just really acting from fear. And it, it wasn't a quick thing. It wasn't like, I just realized it the next day. It took me a couple months of sitting in it and feeling so scared and unable to communicate well and frustration between us. And I finally was able to recognize, you know, to get curious as like, why am I failing in this transition? Right? Like, why am I, I'm, I'm the change goddess. Like, why am I unable to change right now? And I had to really learn, like, we are in a, a stage where boundaries are super unclear and negotiating boundaries is happening at an individual level when it actually should be a kind of a collective journey that we're in. And what I learned about myself in that moment was that I was trying to control the future and control the world and control my partner, and control everything, things that were out of my control. And instead I had to sit with the, the fact that there's a lot that I'm not in control of and I had to get back right-sized into myself. And I had to ask for the boundaries that I actually needed, the ones that were reasonable boundaries. And when I did that, instead of sitting in the fear, when I sat in, here's what I need, my partner was so open, so receptive. We had a totally different kind of conversation. We got on the same side. You know, I was able to hear her. She's like, I'm not, not afraid. I just need people right? I, I, I need people to survive. I need, I, you know, she's an, much more extroverted than I am. I'm like, I just need me and the turtle and you. That's fine. <laughs> right? She's like, that's also not true. You're just terrified. It was so helpful to learn that I was scared and to let, to say, I'm not going to let the fear shape and control the rest of my life in this period of my life. So now we're navigating boundaries. We're making decisions but I'm sleeping much better because I'm not trying to control everybody else around me. I'm just articulating the boundaries I need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Example. Makes it really real. Yeah. Now I want to understand from your work as a facilitator and all of this uh, terrific discovery work that you did yeah. in starting to articulate the principles of emergent strategy, how pleasure activism <laughs> emerged as the next book mm. you wanted to write and as something that was so important to you to really uh, yeah. stand in and stand for. I was really surprised that pleasure activism was the next book that wanted to be written. Um, it, it kept knocking at the door, you know, it just kept coming back and being like, this is really important. And I, I think at the time I was deeply immersed in some fairly large scale movement work that I was seeing so much misery. You know, I was seeing so many people who were trying to change the world, but everything that was happening in their bodies and their somas and their systems and their relationships was no and misery and like repression. And they would secretly, you know, pull me off to the side to talk about drugs or sex or other things that were like giving them some respite. And so I started writing this column that was about sex and about pleasure. And because I was like, I just want to have anyone who's thinking about changing the world needs to be able to touch into the yes. They need, you have to be able to have that erotic sense of yes. You have to have something compelling that is moving you forward. No is not a path forward, right? And I read maybe for the 50th time, this essay from Audre Lorde called The Uses of the Erotic as Power, which I got permission to include in Pleasure Activism. And in it, she talks about how when we have experienced that erotic yes inside of ourselves, it becomes impossible to settle for self-negation and despair and depression and these other states that are not natural to us. And I found that uh, revelation for people who especially have been marginalized and oppressed in some way which part of how oppression works is it is um, trying to pressure you into believing that you are less than and that you should settle for less, that you should settle for being in service, that you should settle for a minimum wage, that you should settle for the, the scraps, the droppings, the, the dregs of life. We're trying to reclaim our humanity from that oppression and it seemed particularly important to me that 
women, people of color, trans people, um, people with disabilities, people who had been cast out of society or cast down into lower classes of society, be able to reclaim that erotic yes. And it's been incredible. That book process has been incredible. I get so many messages from people who are reclaiming some aspect of themselves and discovering that they have a yes, um, that they've always had that yes. You know, we start off with the yes. If you're around kids, kids are very clear, like, I want this. <laughs> I know what I want. This is what I like. I want to play. I'm so alive. And it's how do we reclaim that life force energy? And it's so beautiful. Like, I get a lot of really interesting messages from people too, who are like, I just had an orgasm. I just did this. I just, you know, I'm like, great. Yes. But the thing that most excites me is that aliveness that in the face of all this oppression that could make it very hard to want to stay alive and be alive, that that aliveness is, can be cultivated. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. one thing that I imagine coming up for people who are so in touch with pain in the world yeah. is how do I, start on a path of pleasure activism without denying or yeah. pushing away or putting on top of like lipstick, this That's pleasure right. on top of the heartbreak I'm feeling. And I That's wonder right. how, how you work with that. Well, you know, one of the things that I explore in the book is that pleasure, you know, it's not, it's not hedonistic activism, right? Like it's not, um, only the good, only the indulgent. And it's not excess activism, right? And I actually write about that, that it's not about the capitalist version of these things, but it's more about being able to really feel yourself and feel the truth inside of yourself. What is a yes? What is a no? What is your boundary? What is your consent? Um, what is a coping mechanism? What makes you feel more alive? And getting clear on all that and pleasure, is only actually possible when you can feel the widest range of your emotions. So if I'm denying that I'm angry, I can't have a good orgasm, right? I can't actually access a deep connection with a friend if I'm pushing down something that really needs to be present and accounted for. If I'm grieving, I need a shoulder to cry on. And sometimes the pleasure is in that moment, right? Of deep connection. Um, so that's part of what it is. It's like, can we? return to ourselves the full range of our emotional being, the full range of our lives and the full range of our erotic knowing. And the erotic actually has room for all those emotions, right? So that's how I deal with it is, is like on a day like today, uh, I start my day with my altar. I think about New Orleans and New York and Afghanistan. And I think about my friends in Haiti and I think about all the folks in my life who are displaced by wildfires. I think about my friend Malik who I'm grieving. I think about um, just, I go through kind of the suffering and I'm with it and I honor it. And I honor the lives, the lives that were lived, the lives that are being fought for. That's a huge part of how I start my day. And then I look at what is it that I can do in this day? You know, I'm one person. What are the messages I need to share? What are the connections I need to cultivate in a given day? And, and then I attend to that. I recognize that in the face of my grief, my work is to live fully, right? To live as fully as I can, not knowing how long I have left, right? Which I think a big part of, and I know this sounds maybe strange to some people, but for me, pleasure activism helped me really get in touch with my mortality in a different way. And I was like, this isn't promised. Like none of it is promised. And each day I have a, cho a choice to numb, numbly move through the day, to give the entire day away to some corporation that doesn't care about me or to make the choices of how I wanna live the day. And if it's up to me, I choose poetry. I choose writing, I choose family, I choose love and love making and cooking food and touching the earth. If it's up to me, I choose pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were talking about being at your altar in the morning, I was reminded of something that I read from your writing on your website that you light candles for yeah. what you can't carry. 
That's right. And I thought that was so beautiful. Just to yeah. Say that. It just helps me to, it helps me to humble myself to the fact that there are things beyond my capacity to even hold. There's more grief. You know, uh, my friend, Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams taught me this, that we basically had the, the explosion of technology that allows us to know everything that's happening in the world but we didn't have the simultaneous explosion of our soul's capacity to hold all of that suffering and all of that grief. So, you know, if you go back 200 years, humans only knew about what was happening, you know, in their close circle and news moved very slowly. What you were expected to hold in a given day was very different than it is now. Now you have to hold what grief is happening in your own local life and you also have to be like, how do I sit with the suffering of every, everyone else? And how do I deal with what's happening to the Amazon? And, you know, I've definitely given whole days over to the grief of all that is. And, and then I found that I'm like, what did I do to contribute to the good on those days? I find that it really helps to light the candles. And some days there's 20 candles. Some days there's just one. Um, but I light those candles. I give it over. You know, I'm like, this is what I can't hold. It'll burn. I light the way for those souls that need to transition and find their way on. And then I bring my attention back to the living, the life that I have to live. Mm -hmm. So I wanna, I wanna ask a question that's maybe a little edgy that came up for Yay. me in uh, reading Pleasure Activism. And it, it has to do uh, with this notion, you were talking about how sometimes people can uh, mix up coping, how we're using, uh, and, and I was thinking specifically of someone that I, I knew who seemed to me like a sex addict. Yeah. Now, this is just my, my impression from the outside, and you know, yeah. maybe I was falsely judging this person. I don't, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. But I thought, like, how do we know the difference? This is the core of the question in our own life. Yes. When we're using something like erotic stimulation as a coping mechanism yeah. versus a way to know our full aliveness. How, how do you sort that out? How does anyone sort that out? I find, uh, you know, I, I really, I love this question, actually. I don't think it's too edgy. I think it's a great question. Um, I have found in my own life, uh, I've, I've been on all the different parts of the spectrum, right? Like I've, I've used um, sex and drugs as ways to cope, ways to escape, ways to cover things up. And I've also had the experience of being deeply present and deeply mindful and um, deeply transformed by those same experiences. So much of it is what's happening internally and what's driving the decision-making internally. So as I've gotten older and I've done more meditation and other things, uh, a lot has come to me around attachment and agency. And that's, I think, what I think of as making the difference is, am I attached to a good feeling that is not actually aligned with what's going on in my life? Am I trying to escape what's happening in my life? Um, you know, you can escape it and then you wake back up the next day after that, you know, binge and it's still there and you have to escape it again and escape it again. That's not a way to live, right? So for me, uh, there's this beautiful framework in harm reduction that's drug set and setting. And I think about drug as any substance, right? So it could be sex, it could be a specific drug, prescription drug, or it might just be some experience. You know, some people get this from the gym or something else, but it's like, whatever it is, this thing that gives you an intensity of feeling. And then set is the mindset. What is your mindset? Are you in a state of depression, agitation, confusion? Or are you in a state of clear-mindedness where you can actually look at this? And then setting. And I think of setting both as the immediate setting. So, you know, when I was learning this, it was for people who are using injection drugs. And I was like, okay, you're using this drug, you're feeling depressed, and you're in a public park. That's a high, high, high risk situation, right? Versus you're using this injection drug and you're maybe in an agitated mindset, but you're in a safe injection site. Oh, that's a, a lower risk situation in which to do it, right? I think of that all the time in my own life is even with something like, so ice cream is one of my indulgent places. I'm like, okay, ice cream is the thing I want. What's my mindset right now? If I'm depressed, I wait on the ice cream. 
And I try to sit, figure out, can I feel the feeling, right? How much can I handle actually being present with the feeling? And something that started happening to me a few years ago is I would hold back just a beat and then tears would come. Like if I could wait and not open the freezer, there was actually so much that wanted to be emoted, but it was showing up in the form of go eat ice cream. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, that's been the measure is, and I think about it with a lot of things like, especially as I found myself in a much more stable place mentally and emotionally, I'm like, the world is going to shit. It's very overwhelming, but I'm actually doing okay. And so how do I want to engage in the things that bring me pleasure from that place? How do I make sure I'm not turning away from the world to indulge myself, but being, I right now really think about like, how do I let my orgasms and my ice cream and my you know, joints and whatever else I'm using, how do I let that be of service to my health and my well being and being a good channel through which I can hear what the universe wants me to write and say? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, Adrian, just a few more questions for you. Uh, right. One more in this area of pleasure activism, okay. which is I think one thing that's hard uh, for a lot of us yeah. is to have a full, pleasurable embrace of the shape of our body, the size, the contour. Mm the age, all of that. Uh, There's something about us that we uh, don't feel satisfied with would be a nice way to put it, that we hate (laughs) would be a probably more accurate way to put it, can't stand, loathe. And I'd like to understand more from your own journey with pleasure activism and yourself, how you've come into this pleasurable embrace with your own body. That's great. You know, I love this question because I... I think like many of us, I grew up immersed in a societal obsession with fixing the body, changing the body, dieting, exercising, that there's something wrong with all of our bodies. And I've never really met someone, even people who had like bodies that seemed totally perfect to me. (laughs) I've never really met someone who, if when I talked to them, wasn't like, oh, here's what I'm trying to change about my body. Um, which I think is in and of itself fascinating. But then I grew up as a fat girl. I was I basically, as soon as puberty hit, I started gaining weight and it's gone up and down over the years. Um, and the socialization was, you have to fix this. And so in my family and my friend circles, every other space, you have to fix, you have to fix, you have to fix it. Um, at a certain point in my late twenties, early thirties, I, kind of, I woke up one day and I was like, I don't want this to be the obsession of my life. I don't want to feel constantly like there's something I need to be fixing about myself. What would it look like to intentionally choose to love this body, to accept it as it is and to love it and to listen to it, right? Because there might be changes that are needed, but I don't want them to be externally driven. I really want to listen to my body from the inside out. What I've later learned is, you know, the Ayurvedic approach is your body is healthy, and you're always trying to return to health. If, if you fall away from health, you're just returning to health. Like how would, you know, so it was like my own version of that. I started with my left pinky finger. I would look in the mirror and I would look at that body part and offer love to it, right? Just like, thank you for everything you do to help me when I'm writing and grasping onto things and being a part of hugs and, you know, like just really kind of going in on, on that. And the left pinky finger was the place that I could start because it was really, um, I couldn't argue with how lovable my left pinky finger was, right? And I had to work my way up to um, places that were much, much harder, much more challenging to love, like my arms, my thighs, my belly. Um, These were the parts that society told me were, you know, impossible to love, right? Like they're fat. I have stretch marks. There's cellulite. There's, you know, all the things. And, and yet it's a miraculous part of my miraculous body that is carrying my miraculous life through this world. And there's something massive and strong and beautiful about the particular body that I have. And it's full of stories. So one of the things I did, um, I don't know if people will be able to see this, but I, I, I found creatures that inspired me. So for my arms, I put an elephant and a cow on my arms so that like when I walk around, if I start to forget how beautiful the big 
wide, massive shapes of life can be. I'm reminded of these creatures that are the most peaceful, beautiful, powerful, righteous, and in many places, sacred creatures on earth. And I'm like, I'm also like that, right? Like, I don't imagine the elephants walk around like, oh, my butt looks big. It's like, I am massive, <laughs> you know, being big is the beautiful thing about me. Um, and I also want to say to people who are in this, it's not an, it's not, again, a static thing. It's not like I just got to that place. And I was like, that's it. Just love my body now forever. Every day I have to reattend to this work. You know, I had 30 plus, 40 plus years of being trained not to love my body and to think it needs fixing and to think I need to diet and all this other stuff. So every single day I have to do some kind of intervention. I find with myself still, you know, to be like, wait a second, you know, you are not wrong. You as an existing body are not wrong. You're miraculous. And if you're in pain, there's a lesson there. What is the lesson? What is your body trying to communicate to you? And now I feel like I'm in that zone of my life where I'm like, I'm aging. I have arthritis. I'm getting lines. I have gray hairs. How amazing is that? You know, I made it this far. I'm going to keep making it. Right. An old body is a blessing. <laughs> it's still here. There's still life to be lived. I'm learning that every day. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting you brought up uh, the elephant and how the yes. elephant feels in its body. And one of the parts of your writing that I just really enjoyed that um, mm. titillated me was your many references uh, to different species and what you've learned from them. And yeah. uh, there's a lot we could cover here, but let's just go for two of your favorites that you referred to a lot, the mushrooms and the mycelium network yes. and what we can learn from them and dandelions. Let's cover yes. both. So I'm super into mushrooms. I'm super into mycelium. Um, I've been learning so much about it. I actually just was checking. I have a mushroom log in my backyard that I'm hoping will be sprouting any minute now, <laughs> but I'm trying to actually, it's got a mycelial network growing inside of it that eventually will sprout the fruit of mushrooms, right? But mushrooms have been blowing my mind. Um, there's this writer named Paul Stamets, who um, I think a lot of people may be familiar with. I'm kind of obsessed with. There's a movie called Fantastic Fungi. Um, the thing I love about them is that they are like the great detoxifiers of the earth. Like they can process almost anything into nourishment for themselves. So they're the composters, right? Like um, when something dies in the forest, right? Fungi, fungi, fungi is what comes and figures out how do we compost this? What do we use it for? How do we communicate that this is here to the rest of the uh, known world? And then I also love that they can be used to detox actual spaces. Like if, when we start to recognize that we have put so much toxin into the earth and that needs to turn around, mushrooms are one of the ways that we can okay, let's put mushrooms on this ground and let the mushrooms actually detox the soil and bring it back into health. Um, I use it as a reference point for thinking about people who folks want to dispose and behaviors, human, human behaviors that we want to dispose of is what would it look like to instead be like the mushrooms and figure out how to detox that negative behavior or that violent impulse into something that we let it nourish and we let it move out of our system. Um, I'm also obsessed with how mycelium communicate between trees and other stuff in the forest. So anyway, that's one whole vibe. And then dandelions are another like magical healing property. Like you can eat dandelion roots and drink dandelion tea to actually heal the human body. They're thought of as a weed, right? So you will often hear them referred to as a weed, something people try to get rid of but dandelions carry their entire cell society in themselves. So like when you blow a dandelion that is ready, you know, it's that soft white, um, I think of it as a little soft white Afro of a flower, but when you blow that and all the little dandelion seeds go out, each one lands and it can reproduce an entire field of dandelions. And that to me is just astounding. It's like, how do we be as fecund as a dandelion can be? How do we access the healing properties that we have to bring to any circumstance or situation? And I love the misunderstanding of being seen as a weed, right? When it's like actually a healer. 
I think of that, you know, when I look at the communities that I love and come from, that a lot of us have been seen as weeds, as something to control, as something to remove or excise. And it's like, actually, we're healers unto each other. We can be healers unto the planet. Um, I think that, you know, indigenous communities, those who are still in touch with the original instruction of this earth are dandelions, right? Each of them carries within them whole tomes of wisdom of what we need in order to, to be in right relationship with the planet. So, mm. yeah. And, you know, we started our conversation, Adrian, by talking about fractals. And yes. so it's exactly. the, like the mushrooms in us and the dandelions. Exactly. Because, yeah. you know, I think that's the thing is we're, we're all of the same stuff. We're all nature. You know, if we think of nature as something other than human, that's where we have gone astray. Like we are of all the same stuff. Literally, we have ancestral lineage to mushrooms. We have ancestral lineage to stars. Like, you know, and that's not being woo woo. That's just like science <laughs> shows us that that's the stuff we're made of. So, you know, I like drawing on that aspect of the lineage, especially as someone who's been displaced from so much of my lineage. I like knowing that it's like, well, no matter what I'm of earth. Adrian, I have to bring our conversation to a close, even though I'm finding it extremely challenging inside good. myself here. It's uh, a good problem, you, though. <laughs> yeah, it's a good problem. You, uh, you yeah. mentioned that you're uh, a post-nationalist, and you shared yeah. briefly that in the future, you could see us living more in a tribal configuration. Yeah. And I mentioned in introducing you that you're a sci-fi yeah. scholar. Yes. And one of the things I loved learning is from you is your love of science fiction and what could be called speculative fiction, visions yep. of the future. And I'd like to end on the note of understanding why you think envisioning the future is so useful now, even though we yeah. all, you know, it's kind of, come on, is that, isn't that yeah, just like yeah, fantastical? Yeah. Like really, That's great. come on, you know, and what your vision is, if you were just to say, okay, yeah not only why it's important, but I'll go ahead. I'll share my sci-fi what vision. I'm doing. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the thing that makes the future important to me is that the world that we currently live in was imagined by other people. And uh, so we, we're walking around, you know, I say this, we're walking around inside of someone else's imagination of how this world could work. Someone imagined white supremacy, right? That's not real. There's no science basis for it, but someone imagined it and then they shared that imagination until it took hold in people's minds. And some people actually believed it and structured entire societies around it, right? Someone imagined our current incarceral system, right? And was like, oh, this is, this is how we'll handle justice. And even though it doesn't work, the imagination that it will work, the imagination that it will rehabilitate people in some way um, keeps us committed to this dysfunctional system. Um, when Mike Brown was killed, right? He was killed because a police officer imagined that he was in danger, even though this was an unarmed kid who was walking home, right, from the store. And that imagination was so powerful that it held up in court, right? That they were like, oh, he imagined he was in danger and that's more important than what was really happening. So I think imagination is so important. And then I think thinking of the future is a way that we start to say, we recognize that the circumstances, the thing that we've been imagined and, and living into now, doesn't actually work for the majority of us. We want to imagine the futures that actually work for the majority of us. And I think we have to imagine it before we can begin to structure it, begin to practice it. So already people have imagined abolition and already people have imagined socialism, people have imagined cooperative economics, people have imagined, our, uh, a disability justice framework for the world. So now we're practicing, how do we live into a different way of being in right relationship with each other? My vision for the world, my vision for the future is one in which everyone feels like their imaginations matter. Everyone feels like their bodies matter and they have sovereignty over what they get to decide to do with their bodies. Everyone feels a sense of responsibility to the collective, to the whole, and we make decisions together, right? So it's like, I get to choose what I do with my body and I'm in relationship with a whole bunch of other people who I actually care about and we make decisions together. And in my vision of the future, we're in a totally wildly different relationship with the planet. So, and it's a direct one. 
And it kind of scares me to think about it. You know, like, ah, what would it feel like to do this? But I love the idea that, and I think we are structured to be in communities that are growing our food together and raising our children together and where people get to feel safe. Um, I imagine these mycelial networks of human beings where we still get to have a global experience, but it's not one where we're taking advantage of each other or warmongering, but one in which we are sharing what we figure out, sharing what is delicious, um, sharing what is pleasurable amongst us. And of course, we're in touch with aliens who are very cool and it's awesome. I've been speaking with Adrian Marie Brown, and I have to say, I feel a big yes inside as I listen to the description you're offering as our possible future and the power of imagining it together. Thank you so much for the depth of this conversation and really all the work you've done, deep work on emergent strategy and pleasure activism and your new book, Holding Change. Sounds true, waking up the world. Thanks everyone for being with us.